this is a talk on sensor and sensibility, obvious from the title. Uh, I'm mostly actually going to talk about sensibility, because um, there are a bunch, if you want to learn about sensor, there's some really good documentation, there's some really good talks online about that. Um, I haven't got any presenter notes, I should fix that. Great. OK, cool. So I work at Yelp. Um, this is America. I normally need to do an intro when I talk about Yelp in, in Europe, but I'll assume that you all know what Yelp does. Um, and I'm an SRE, so that's a site reliability engineer. Um, and that basically means that I've got two jobs. And those two jobs, number one is don't break the site, ever. Ever, 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 the site never goes down. And number two is allow developers to change and break the site as much as possible. Those two jobs might be in conflict sometimes. Um, and so I'm going to basically talk around that and talk around our monitoring system and how I've set it up and, and how it helps us balance those goals against each other. Um, so let's start with the kind of traditional. Um, well, let's move slides. Start with the traditional kind of failure, disappointment, hatred, you know, general ops feelings. Um, so I'm going to talk about kind of one, I mean, this, this DevOps conflict and sadness um, comes across the organization if you don't do anything about it. But I'm going to talk about specifically the monitoring system um, and how, how the monitoring system either helps or hinders dev and ops communicating. Um, so we used to use Nagios. Uh, it kind of sucked. Um, and that's, that's not hating on Nagios. That was kind of only half of Nagios's fault. Um, and you know, the other half was definitely how we'd implemented Nagios, um, the way we were using it. So the kind of failure points were that to make a monitoring change, you had to actually you know, open a text file and use VI, um, which sucked. Um, if you wanted to change the monitoring for one of our services, then developers have to request operations to make a change. Um, and then operations have to manually deploy that, and that sucked. Um, and that led to low developer visibility about production. Um, developers you know, can't read the monitoring. Um, source code, so, so just confusion. Um, and you basically end up in this situation, of course. Um, developers don't know what's happening in production because we've arranged the monitoring so that they can't know what's happening in production. So they're basically doing this. Um, pager details are out of date because we've got manual changes. Then only some of the hosts that are running services are actually monitored for running those services. Um, developers can't, half the developers don't actually have permission to go and act alerts, uh, even when they're on call. Um, the acts are insane. Um, escalating issues either to developers finding out which developers are responsible for a service if I get paged about something, or developers if they think they've got a problem with their service that's actually a systems problem. That escalation is really hard. Um, ops have a lot of pain. The alerts are too noisy. Therefore, ops end up ignoring alerts because um, we can't triage them. Lots, you end up with ops getting lots of mail spam, but I'm like, oh, well, what even is this service? What does it do? Who looks after it? I don't know. Shall I just, just you know, go back to sleep and ignore it? Um, shall I email developers at and kind of pray? Um, everything's pretty terrible, and it leads to post-mortems and sadness and fail. Um, because if, if monitoring is only an ops problem, then basically you're going to end up with everything on fire all of the time. I mean, that's, that's kind of normality. So it's really hard to know what's actually broken uh, if everything's on fire. Um, and one of the other problems that we had is we didn't have any situational awareness. So you, know, you wouldn't know what alerts were important or not. If you logged into a box, you wouldn't know if that box was healthy or not. Uh, you expect broken windows, and therefore you, you don't take responsibility. You, you don't go, oh, that thing's red in the alerting system. I'll just go and spend you know, 10 minutes looking into it, because why would I do that if I know that I'm not going to spend 10 minutes looking into it? I'm going to spend two hours and just end up crying. Why would I want to do that? Um, so you get high friction. You get low trust. Um, you get low visibility. And the crazy thing is here that actually it, it's not that anyone's doing it wrong. Um, you know, ops are trying really hard. Developers are trying really hard. But we've just arranged things such that we can't succeed, which sucks. You know, when your normality is kind of like this, um, your monitoring system is killing you with a thousand cuts. You've got Stockholm syndrome because you know you're used to being paged 20 times a day. Um, I just like to say that this is pretty fucked up. 
it is. Uh, and I'm painting a bleak picture here. I, I'm not really saying that everything at my company was like this cryingly bad, but we did have all of these problems. Um, you know, even if they only made me cry once or twice a week, not every day. Um, these are definitely the types of problems that we had. So we were thinking at, at looking at our alerting and our monitoring uh, and working out um, how, to, how to fix this. Because, well, what is a monitoring system actually other than the communications tool? I mean, the only thing that your monitoring system is doing is, is it is communicating to you this thing is broken. Or hopefully, if you've got it right, it's communicating to you that this thing is broken. Um, if you haven't got it right, quite often your monitoring system is communicating to you that something is something which is not all that helpful. Um, but yeah, communication. And I was, I was, I was thinking about this. This, this, this to me, um, as I was actually writing these slides, I suddenly realized, ah, oh, well, actually, monitoring is just communication. And DevOps, actually, the entire concept of DevOps can pretty much be reduced to, well, communication. You know, if, if ops and devs actually talk and work together. So, so really, I, I think that the technical changes that we made and the cultural changes that we made are pretty much in lockstep here, and they enable each other. Um, so as an SRE uh, and as part of an ops department, it's actually a core competency for me to you know, give developers what they need. Um, and that means getting the monitoring system right. You know, that's, that's a core part of my job, or it should be. Um, so we decided to do that you know, really smart thing that's bound to work always and change everything. Because you know, we all know that large projects work really well, right? I mean, I've got a few slides to illustrate how well large projects generally work and how incredibly low risk they are. Um, and you know, if we screw our monitoring up, everything's going to be fine, right? Well, no, not really. Um, so this is actually pretty scary when you think about it. Um, but then it all comes down to communication again. Um, I, I really like this graphic. This is from a, a pretty recent survey. Um, and so like, the most important things are requirements and team communication. And working out what the requirements are is communication. So, so basically, it's, it's all about communication. And we knew that, well, we knew that our current monitoring system didn't work. We didn't necessarily know how it didn't work or why it didn't work or what would be better, just the, there was something that could be better. Um, and different teams want to work in different ways. And we, we basically needed to try out different things until we actually found out what worked for uh, the organization as a whole, the ops team, and, and like individual development teams. Because different teams are going to work different ways. Um, and the ops is a pretty large organization. Um, and we have lots of teams. I, I mean, I, I, I pulled up the number yesterday, which I, I stupidly haven't written down. But if I remember, we've got like 30 different teams in PagerDuty or something ridiculous like that. So that, that's you know, 26, 30 on-call escalation teams. Um, that's really hard. And that actually means we're at a level that we can't pick a product off a shelf. Uh, you know, we can't go, well, let's buy a monitoring solution, and that will solve all of our problems. Because no, most of our problems aren't technical. They're, they're actually, you know, the technical part is the easy part. They're all people problems. Um, so the only way to do this sensibly was to iterate. You know, we don't know what right is, just that we haven't got it yet. So the way that this is, has worked is to not do a big bang change. Um, so we started running Sensor in parallel with Nagios, and we've been gently moving things across and having conversations with, you know, has this made things better? Has this not made things better? We've screwed things up. Um, we've, you know, deleted that code and done it differently. Um, and the iteration is absolutely key to the project success um, because we've only really worked out what success looks like by iterating. You, know, you often don't know if something's better until you, right, well, let's try it for two weeks. Were the pages better? Did we get paged less? OK, cool, that was worth it. No, it was terrible. I woke up at 3 AM. OK, let's not do that. Um, so I've kind of talked about the human reasons and the communication reasons. Um, <coughs> there were a bunch of technical reasons for choosing Sensu um, as well. And kind of as I said, the monitoring is actually a core competency. So I wanted a monitoring system that we could work with um, rather than work around and fight against. Um, so some of the things about Sensu make it really attractive. Um, and these are some of the, the really key things for me. Um, so it being pluggable and extensible. Um, you, can, you can tag things in Sensu with completely arbitrary metadata that you made up yourself. And then 
that metadata gets passed all the way through Sensu, and at the other end, you can do things based upon that. So, for example, we've extended the Sensu metadata with which team this alert belongs to. Uh, and that gets passed all the way through, so you suddenly know, oh, this thing is being monitored for this team, and therefore we should probably alert this team. Dead easy. Um, it's really simple. Sensu is really simple, or, or at least the way that we're using it is really simple. Um, there's a client component that checks things, there's a server component that processes those checked results, um, and there's a rabbit MQ in between, but the communication is just clients check things, send results, servers process those results. That simple. Um, and it's written in Ruby, um, which you know, may or may not be your favorite language, um, but Ruby's pretty easy to read and pretty easy to extend. Uh, and that was kind of one of the core requirements. I mean, it didn't, the fact that Sensu is in Ruby, if it was in Python, that would also have been fine. Or if it was in Perl, that would also have been fine. Um, you know, not being C and, and you know, not needing to spend three weeks learning how this complicated C project is put together, um, or kind of the goals here. You know, anything that you can pick up and hack within a day or two's work. Um, so, yeah, um, Nagios. I, I'll talk for a minute or two about Nagios. Um, I, and and I, I love, I just love these sorts of phrases because, well, I, I'll not tell you what they make me think of because I probably shouldn't swear too much on stage. Um, but no, no, I mean, I'm not gonna hate on Nagios all that much, it does work. Um, it does work, it's really simple to set up, lots of people know it, um, that's great. When you're a large organization and you need to be flexible and you actually need to be really customizing things, um, Nagios doesn't fit that well. Um, so let's take the inevitable cheap shot. Um, it's ugly, yeah. Um, that's not a big deal, or, or that's not so much of a big deal compared to this. Um, one of the key problems with Nagios for me is that it's the whole system. Like, it's monitoring and it's alerting and it's scheduling everything jammed into one thing. And if you don't like part of that and you want to replace part of that, that's not all that easy. Um, so actually, like one of the first things that we actually did to fix things, we just throw away half of Nagios and move all of the kind of paging and alerting to pager duty. And that means that you know, half of this diagram is suddenly pointless. Well, why are we running it? Um, great. OK, so, so that's, that's one of the things I'm hating on. Um, one of the other things that I'm not a fan of is like working out Nagios's internal state involves parsing files like this. And, and I mean, some people enjoy that sort of thing, sure, but I really don't. Uh, I don't want to have to write software to parse your status file of weirdness, or, well, there are Ruby gems and Python things to that, and they all kind of do a half assed job. Um, and because you haven't got any extensible metadata, then you're going to have to start dropping JSON in comments to extend it, and, and, and it's, it's just generally horrible. Um, another example, telling things to Nagios. Um, here's some code that I wrote the other day, and like, this is not all that bad other than what are all those ones for? I, I can't remember. You know, I wrote this three days ago. Really self-documenting? I think not. Um, and, and one of the key problems about Nagios is it's really centralized. It's, it's really centralized, uh, and so Nagios needs to know what clients and what servers it's going to be checking in advance, and Sensu doesn't. You, know, you can just spin up a Sensu client and just start sending stuff to the server without the server having any config for your client. And so you know, if you're doing cloud things and you want to avoid shouting, that's really, really useful and handy. Um, because, well, I mean, you can, you can do this with Nagios and exported resources and Puppet. Um, but you end up in a world where you need a two-run convergence and everything's terribly slow. And if you're booting up servers that like last 20 minutes and then go away again, well, you probably haven't even started monitoring them on the Nagios server yet um, before they've gone away, at which point all your alerts get applied to the machine that went away two minutes ago and they all go red and you cry. Um, so <laughs> this, this is... Again, you can make Nagios work, but I really didn't want to. Um, but, you know, that's, that's not the sort of problem I actually want to solve. Um, so, okay, so how does Sensu work? I hate this diagram, because this is the diagram that everybody always uses. Um, and this is, it looks incredibly complicated. Um, we don't use most of this stuff um, at all. 
So we only use standalone checks, um, and that's what the Puppet module does by default. So every client, we just drop the config for what's gonna be checked on that client. Um, and the central server processes results, but the central server has no knowledge about the individual hosts or what they should be monitoring. Um, which is much simpler than, than kind of this horrible picture. Um, okay, so real quick, the kind of data flow through Sensu. Um, every client runs checks. All the checks go into RabbitMQ. Um, Sensu server processes pick those check results up and do things with them, um, including writing some state into Redis. And we've got everything is arranged with HA. There's two of everything. Um, and so if things explode, then you get a failover. But that's fine. That's actually fine because how often does your monitoring system explode? Well, if you miss the fact that your monitoring system exploded for two minutes while your monitoring system fails over, why would I care? Like, that's no big deal. Uh, and, you know, we try to not make the monitoring system and the website explode at the same time, uh, and then we're good, right? So it's, yeah, everything's behind HA proxy. Things just fall over. Um, all works really well, except for the obvious, well, th this seems to be what everybody asks, um, <laughs> which is completely fair, um, but I have a, kind of the same problem with Nagios. H how, how do I tell that I haven't made a typo in my Nagios config and then restarted Nagios and it has, has not restarted? Because I used to do that all the time. Um, and the answer is, well, you have multiple Nagios servers and they check each other, and well, the same solution works in Sensu. Um, you just, we have multiple data centers. Each data center has Sensu, monitors things in that data center, and also the other data center Sensus, and that's fine. Um, okay, so going back to, to Sensu is really nice. Um, the machine readable config. Um, the, the arbitrary metadata that's extensible, um, you just drop JSON files on disk. And generally, um, JSON is a really bad choice for configs that you're going to edit by hand, you know, because there are no comments or, uh, and et cetera. Um, but, well, I've come to the very strong conclusion, if you're editing your monitoring config by hand, you're doing it wrong. Because, well, you know, I have Puppet configuring services on a machine, the same puppet code that's configuring the service should be configuring the monitoring, and if it isn't, and I have to go and type things manually somewhere else, I'm doing it wrong. So the fact that the census config is JSON is fine, it's great, because it makes it really easy to parse, uh, and, and it's not meant to be human readable at that level, because the human readable part, well, that's all we have puppet for, right? So this, this, as a user, is kind of our, our key sensor abstraction. Um, so you just define, this is a puppet define, it's called monitoring check. Um, the name, what it does should be kind of obvious to you. Um, so all of these parameters um, are kind of our custom stuff, and that, this is all just custom metadata that we've kind of added in. Um, so yeah, there's a flag to say, you know, this alert's important, paid someone, that defaults to false. Um, this automatically, um, our machines know which team owns them because, for example, our Elasticsearch hosts are owned by the search team. Uh, and so these checks, by default, will go to the team that owns that machine, which is awesome. Uh, you can override this, of course, if you have you know, some things that you want to go to operations and things you want to go to DBAs, you can manually override that. Our servers just know. Um, one of the things we didn't like about Sensu was kind of the tunables for how often to alert. So we just rewrote them. Um, we defined what we wanted it to do ourselves. We used the extension metadata, and, and we just rewrote them. Sensor's that flexible. It's pretty easy. Um, one of the other awesome things, uh, this is mandatory. Every monitoring check has to have a run book. Um, like that Y slash, that's our internal URL shortener. Um, but yeah, so every alert has a run book. Um, which, which, well, why would you monitor something if you weren't prepared to write a paragraph about what the hell you're monitoring and why and how to maybe fix it? <laughs> um, well, uh, but if you don't enforce this, people won't. Uh, and if you don't have these things close to each other and actually connected, the, then nobody will find that alert documentation. But, you know, this, this allows, like, when someone gets paged, um, the app has a link in it that they can click on that opens the documentation for the alert that they just got. You know, why would we not just do this? Um, okay, so 
Uh, there's a really good Sensu Puppet module, and that's absolutely what our monitoring check stuff is using under the hood. Um, one of my favorite things about this module is it's comment safe. Uh, and by comment safe, what I mean is, if you comment out the puppet code that makes the check, then the check goes away, because it's in a directory that's set for puppet to auto purge it, um, which is good. I, I, you know, I like if I comment out something from my server, that thing stops being on my server, um, especially for monitoring, because you know you really don't want to monitor services that you're not running anymore. Um, yeah, and it's really simple. Every check gets an individual JSON file. Um, and, well, these JSON files are kind of pretty ugly, actually. Uh, but again, it's machine readable config, not human readable config. Um, and don't be too scared. We'll work through this quickly. Um, so these are standard in, in basically all of our alert, in all of our checks. This is simple mode, basically, those, those three flags. Checks get run on the client, server can't schedule checks. Um, secure mode, that you can't break into the server and make things be executed on clients, just clients run stuff by themselves and send it back to the server. Um, these are our custom like alerting tunables that we added. Um, there's the runbook parameter, again. Um, basically, all of this is the custom metadata that we added. You know, so, so, so the great bulk of the check is actually just our custom stuff. More than half the data here is, is our custom extensions. That's, that's why, ah, no, here we go. This is, sorry, this is all the custom stuff. I'm looking at the wrong screen here. Um, so every alert has a team. Um, every alert has a, like a bunch of flags. The project is, is, if you'd like this, alert to raise tickets, what JIRA project to do it in, what IRC channel to you know, shout about this in. Um, all sort, yeah, there's all sorts of kind of extensions that we found. Uh, if a monitoring system could do this, it would be really useful. Okay, so we just add it. Uh, and again, because the metadata is extensible, we can just add things into this JSON, even if nothing's paying attention to them yet. So, so you can work out, would this facility you know, be useful? Okay, prototype out the interface at one end, cool. We've got the JSON, and then you know, as a second step, we can then start doing something about it. Um, and that's, that's been really useful for iterating on this. Um, okay, so check scripts. So, so whenever sensor is actually going to check something, it, it basically just runs a script for you. Um, they're really simple, like Nagios scripts. They just have a simple exit status. Um, the interesting part is that the client runs that check, takes the exit status and like one line of output. It adds that into all the check metadata that we saw like a couple of slides ago, and it sends all of that to the server. So the server gets the entire context, including all of that metadata. And that allows the server to then, yeah, know what project to raise the ticket in, in Jira, for example, um, which is cool. And, and the handlers, right? So at the back end, clients are submitting checks. At the back end on the server, sent, sent to server, a handler gets called for um, the actual, look, something happened, do something with it. Um, so we have a bunch of handlers, and I'll, I'll cover them kind of really quickly. Um, we have a base handler that sensor is object oriented, so we have a base class that all of our handlers inherit from, um, and like the the check timing and re alert stuff that I was talking about, that's all implemented in the base handler, um, one place, dead easy, you know, override one method, job done. I mean, well, no, I got it wrong because uh, I wrote some unit tests and I'd screwed it up, and then I wrote some more unit tests and I'd really screwed it up. But it, it was still like you know one method and and 500 one you know 20 line method and 500 lines of unit tests until I'd not screwed it up, um, but all in one place, that easy. Um, so yeah, we've got a Jira handler because you know a bunch of things. Um, please don't page me for this. Just raise a ticket. You know if if one elastic search box dies, why would you bother paging me? That's that's why we run a million. But I definitely would like a Jira ticket. So that we don't forget, you know, and, and say keep paying Amazon for that piece of hardware that crashed three months ago. Um, some crazy people actually want email. Like, no, they do. <laughs> this this was an ongoing argument that everybody in operations were, was like, no, you don't want this. And teams like, no, yeah, we do want this. Fine, we ended up implementing that later. Like, it did take a couple of months for us to to keep going. Do you really want that? Okay, whatever. D different teams work different ways. That's, that's, 
you know, we don't use it to email because that's silly, but some teams like that. Uh, and, and that's part of the flexibility that we actually want here is for t individual teams to be able to choose how they want to receive their alerts. Um, IRC, I really like IRC, situational awareness. Um, you can just go and, uh, like every team has a couple of channels, one for critical alerts and one for non-critical alerts. Um, so you can kind of see, you know, if the network engine, if you get a bunch of alerts as the operations person, oh, let's just go into the network engineering channel and see what they broke. Oh, there was a BGP flap two minutes ago. No wonder none of the networking's working. Um, so it's, IRC is really, really useful. Um, page duty, of course, um, like calendars are hard. Um, alerting and monitoring is definitely a core competency. Being good at calendars, not a core competency. So we use page duty for that. Um, AWS prone. Uh, this is a really good one. Um, so all of our AWS machines, um, when, when they start making alerts, we check the AWS API to see, well, is this still a machine? Because like, if I terminate this, and now I'm getting keep alive alerts that this machine went away, well, I should not bother paging someone because they terminated the machine, right? That would be dumb. So we don't. If you terminate a machine in AWS, all of its alerts just go away magically. Because you know, if, you, if you actually press the terminate button while well, you chose to terminate that machine, you've got to, tr you've got to trust people. And, and you know, trusting people to remember to go and delete the alerts somewhere, as well as terminating the machine, is much more likely to go wrong than trusting people to actually terminate machines if they want to terminate machines. Um, okay, so uh, how does get run? Um, yeah, I've talked about check scripts. They're really simple. You can write them in whatever. Um, uh, we have check scripts in Shell, in Ruby, in Python, in Perl, and I think we have a couple in Go. Um, like, literally, whatever people feel like writing them in today is, is fine. Um, and we install all the Sensu plugins, and we install all the Nagios plugins, because they're, they're cross-compatible. So there's like two entire libraries of plugins that you can use, which is great. In fact, even if you're not going to run Sensu, and you're going to stick with Nagios, I recommend checking out the Sensu plugins. Because uh, some of the checks in there are much better than some of the Nagios ones, and they are just compatible both ways. Um, yeah, so everything runs on the clients. The clients are all managed by Puppet, um, which is great. And then for more complicated things, um, each Sensu client has a TCP socket on localhost, and you can just connect to localhost and kind of squirt JSON at it. So if you want to do really, really complicated things, and I've got a couple of examples in a minute, um, you can just squirt JSON in. Um, and then um, servers. So we have a bunch of things that you want to run in exactly one place. And Sensu servers have a like master election thing, so you can check, is this Sensu server the master? And so the way that we do that, for, for, for an example, is like looking at AWS CloudWatch alarms. You, know, you want one machine to go out, hit the AWS API, suck in CloudWatch alarms, and then make events from it. You don't want to push that out to you know, half a dozen machines, but you want to make sure it runs on exactly one machine. And so the way that we do that, we push it to all of our servers, but then it runs on all the servers. The first thing that the check does is it checks, is this machine the Sensu master? If not, exit true, nothing happened. If, if it is a Sensu master, then we go and do a load of work, and then pull in loads of CloudWatch alarms, and then we squirt those at the local Sensu socket. So actually one check can report hundreds of results potentially, um, which is kind of a neat trick. Um, and then, then this is just an IAM role. Um, so we let everything that's a Sensu server gets an IAM role, and that allows it to do all the things it needs to in Amazon, like you know, check if hosts are up for the termination um, alert removal, um, look at auto-scaling groups, various things that we just, just check from the servers. Um, OK. So Situational awareness is one of the points that I kind of raised earlier. Um, this is what things actually look like kind of now. Um, so you log into a box, and you can see the sensor alerts that failed on this box. You see that my, my prompt is even a little campfire here. Uh, and that means that, well, th this box has sensor alerts. So you know, just when you're logging into machines, you'll actually see there are alerts on this machine. And you, you, you know, if you've got five minutes, you might go and check that out and fix it, um, which is great. Um, and situational awareness, well, for example, we, we, have, I mean, we have dev VMs that are per developer, but we also have a bunch of shared developer resources. Um, why would you page me 
if a developer is using all the disk space on a shared dev resource? Because, I mean, what am I going to do other than maybe go and shout at them? And why could we not make the computer go and shout at them? So, I mean, that's exactly what we've done. Um, we, we now kind of send out a, a strongly worded email suggesting that, you know, using eight gigabytes of memory uh, and like a terabyte of disk is maybe not being a good citizen. Um, and that even sometimes works. So sometimes you do actually have to go and shout at a person. And, and so I don't know how, but like actually going and shouting at someone rather than the computer sending them an email seems to be more effective. I, I wish I had a fix for that, but I don't. Um, okay, so now move, move, moving on. Um, one of the other things that I kind of feel pretty strongly about that we've done really right in Sensu that we weren't doing really right at all in Najos um, is having a single source of truth to things. Um, now, we've made the choice that DNS is canonical for what box runs Sensu, and I'm not saying this is the only right choice at all. Um, I mean, I don't care whether you configure things with DNS or Hero data or, you know, there's another million methods. I don't care which, as long as it's exactly one of them. If you have to configure DNS and Hero data, then you're doing it pretty wrong. Um, you want to configure things in one place. So how do we do that? Well, I actually just open source the library that lets you do lots of network functions from Puppet. So we just go and resolve the IP addresses. Like Sensu servers in every environment are always sensu.local.yelp.com. We go and work out all the IP addresses associated with that, and then we can check, is that IP address one of my IP addresses? Oh, well, that means I must be a Sensu server. Duh. Um, you can just work out you know, from DNS, canonically, if you should be a Sensu server. Um, which is cool. Um, th this, this also nicely shows off structured facts, if you've not seen that before. Um, I, I only realized that after the fact. Pretty cool. Um, cool. Um, and so having, having baked everything into Puppet at this kind of level lets us do a load of really nice things where you get like automatic monitoring. Because you know, who lo well, who's had cron spam before? OK, who, keep your hand up if you love cron spam. You're crazy. You are crazy. Um, what's your email address again? <laughs> um, no, cron spam's really bad. So, so we have um, a cron wrapper that is, a, again, a puppet define, and it's cron colon colon d, and drops the file in it, set cron cron dot d, um, with a load of defaults again. And one of our defaults is to send the output to dev null, because if you didn't tell me where to send it, you do not email that shit to root at, please. Um, <laughs> Uh, and actually, actually, really, well, we, most of the time, if you're doing it right, you actually want some sort of checking here, but our checking should not be send everybody on the team email if this doesn't work. Um, and in fact, for a lot of cron jobs, you don't care if it's broken for like a couple of hours, just as long as it runs every so often. Um, so we just, we have this wrapper that will prefix the command you're gonna run in cron with another shell script, and that shell script will automatically kind of tell Sensu if your command worked or didn't. And it just, just by writing out a couple of really simple flag files, um, and we then, we can kind of pretty much ignore the code other than the bottom line where we say create resources monitoring check. So if you, if you write a cron job, um, the only thing that you have to do in your cron job is say that this cron job ha can at max be two hours stale. You know, that's, that's the longest time it's allowed to fail and not run for, and then if it's been failing for two hours, then you'll get a JIRA ticket. Bingo, automatic. Um, pretty easy to implement as well, and so, so much better than cron spam. You know, doing the right thing by default is pretty great, because it turns out that if you make it easy to do the right thing, then people will do the right thing. Could have guessed. Uh, okay, um, another one, uh, another example, is or one of the problems that we had um, is developers are developing and pushing new services all the time, new versions of services. Uh, and so obviously, as services change, what you want to check to see if that service is alive is likely to change. Um, and if you have to ask ops to make that change, that sucks as a developer. Um, and in fact, we want developers to be able to get their own alerts, uh, and maybe they want to you know, email themselves, check and email themselves whenever performance was bad. Or I don't know what they want to do. I, I, I don't want to have to know what they want to do. 
Um, so we use the same trick um, pretty much again with running a check that then goes and does a load of stuff and reports more than one check result to the local client socket. Um, so this is Python. Um, we actually wrote, we've wrote, written and open sourced a nice little client library in Python for talking to the Sensu socket and giving it well-formed messages um, because a lot of our stuff's in Python because reasons. Um, so this will actually go and go through every service that's deployed <coughs> on a box and look through a YAML file that is deployed with every service. And if developers put in instructions for how to monitor this service, they get monitoring for free. Uh, and they can change that monitoring just by editing something in their services, Git repository, and redeploying their service. Don't need to talk to ops, which is good. Um, and surprisingly, if you put the monitoring and the data right next to the code, when people change the code, there's a much higher chance of them remembering to change the monitoring too. If the two things are completely separate, well, people forget. You know, people are people. And I'm not saying there's a 100% success rate even with this, but, but it's, it's gone from you know, a 5% success rate to a 75% success rate, which, which is a pretty massive change. Um, and this is an example in Ruby. We've got another thing that gives you, um, if you've got a service, you can have, make a few YAML keys, get monitoring for free. Um, literally for free, three, three lines of YAML. In fact, our, our generate me a new templated service, we have a little utility that will do that for you know, my first service. Um, it'll give you, you know, the current best practices for how we do services. You'll get out of this template something with monitoring baked in already. So you know, when you first push the first version to a dev environment, then you'll get monitoring. Uh, and that monitoring will come to you because it's already pre-baked that, well, the service creation script knows who ran it. So to start with, the thing that gets baked into the monitoring is, right, alert the guy who made the service. And then you know, when, when it's no longer your service and it's your team's service that's going to production, you can just change that to your team. You know? Again, in, in your Git repository, one line change. Don't need to talk to me. It's great. I, I like people not talking to me, especially if they're not sharing their problems. Cool. So. Um, yeah, it, and again, it's, it's amazing. If you put like all the metadata about what your service should be doing and what its SLA should be and what it's talking to into the same place, and things just work a lot better. Um, and yeah, allowing, allowing developers to screw it up and to get the alerts to tell them that they screwed it up is really powerful. Um, and in fact, on a larger scale, that helps keep the site up more because developers are able, that they'd actually feel connected. You know, they can push a staging version of a service with a bajillion alerts that spam the heck out of them if they've got you know, a worrying change that they're worried about deploying. Um, so this is today's example. Like literally, one of my colleagues implemented this today. This is the warning email that you get if you're being a bad person on a development machine. Um, so it's like, yeah, you're using eight gigs of RAM and you're using uh, you know, too much of a disk uh, and et cetera. You actually get an email telling you what you did wrong. Here are some debugging commands so that you can work out you know, what, which one of your processes are doing that. Um, so certainly for junior developers, this is really, really handy because you know, half the time a dev machine is being broken by an intern and they don't even actually know what they're running that's broken things. So, so if you send them an email that tells them what, how to diagnose their own stuff, then works really well. Um, okay, so work in progress, cluster checks. This is one of the things that doesn't come out of the box in Sensu. Again, we're, we're developing it, we're open sourcing it. Um, because going back to my Elasticsearch example, I don't want to be paged. I want a Jira ticket, but I don't want to be paged if like one server blows up. You know, I want to know if 20% of the servers have blown up. Um, if, a service, if a service is fully unavailable, if a certain percentage of servers have blown up, um, yeah, make a Jira ticket unless I actually should care now, please. Um, and this is, this is all, all still a work in progress. Um, we haven't entirely moved off Nagios. Um, we're doing that pretty fast now. Um, and we're also open sourcing all the pieces that we've built pretty fast now. Um, but it's been, it's been a journey. And, and the, the technical stuff is has pushed this forward, but most of the change um, is actually um, a social change. 
You know, the, the technical stuff, well, once you've worked out what you actually want to do, implementing that is pretty easy. It's the working out what you want to do part that's hard. Um, cool, and that's, that's everything I had to say. The, the slides will be up. Um, there's a load of links to all the open so source stuff. Um, I'm being told I need to wrap up because I've run out of time. Uh, so I don't know if I've got time for some questions, but I'm happy to talk to people afterwards or later. Cool, thanks everybody.